All right, now that I've finished preparing the clay bed, it's time to actually make the mold. So since I created this mold on top of a wooden board, I am just giving it a nice generous coat of Murphy oil soap. So that way, in case I accidentally spill some of the plaster onto this wooden board, it will release nice and easily. In addition, I like to coat my coddle boards with Murphy oil soap so that they will release nicely from the mold. When creating molds for slip casting, it's important to use number one pottery plaster. You don't want to use plaster of Paris. You really only want to use number one pottery plaster. Number one pottery plaster is specifically designed to work with clay, and it is especially good for slip casting. The thing that makes number one pottery plaster so great is that it's very porous, and this is what you really want when you're slip casting. The way it works is the number one pottery plaster acts like a gigantic sponge. It sucks the water out of the slip, turning it into clay, creating a nice, even clay wall, which is exactly what you want when you are slip cast. Plaster of Paris doesn't work this way. You don't want to use plaster of Paris. I've made a mold before out of plaster of Paris, and it doesn't really work very well. The plaster of Paris is much too dense of a material, it doesn't make a very good sponge, and it doesn't do a very good job at all of sucking the water out of the slip and turning it into a clay wall. So you could use plaster of Paris, but it is not going to work very well for slip casting. As you can see, I was just rolling out a whole bunch of clay coils so that I can add them inside this whole piece to seal it so that when I pour the plaster inside, it will not leak out. Once I have my coils in place and cleaned up, it's time to mix the plaster. I prefer the volume method when I am mixing my plaster. The ratio is one part water to one and a half parts plaster. You always start with the water first and you always use cold water. Warm water speeds up the process meaning your plaster will set up more quickly. When I sift the plaster into the water, I sift it in fairly slowly. I don't just dump it in because if I do that, then I'm gonna create sort of large lumps of plaster in there, which will take longer to hydrate. And it has the potential to cause lumps in my plaster when I begin to stir. Once you sift the plaster into the water, this is what is referred to as slaking, S-L-A-K-E. So what that means is you want the plaster to soak in all of that water. So generally you can let your plaster slake for three to maybe 20 minutes, definitely not longer than 20 minutes. The reason you don't want your plaster to slake for more than 20 minutes is because by then it will begin to set up and you won't be able to do anything with it. I slake my plaster for three to five minutes, generally speaking. Um, but for sure, no longer than 20 minutes. The reason you wanna slake your plaster for at least three minutes is so that you don't have any lumps and your plaster is nice and smooth. After you slake your plaster, then you need to stir it for three to five minutes. The reason you wanna stir your plaster for three minutes is so that it will fully absorb the water. If you don't stir it for the full three minutes, you will find that after you pour your plaster in between your coddle boards, you'll end up with a thin film of water at the very top as it sets up. If this happens, it means that your plaster to water ratio is not as good as it should be. It is important for your plaster to be one to two inches above the highest point of your clay piece. So on the coddle board, I'm marking the hummingbird's highest point and then another mark about one and a half inches above that. That is where I want my plaster to roughly hit the mark. As you are pouring, you wanna make sure that you are creating a nice gentle flow as to not introduce air bubbles into the mold. This is inevitable, but you wanna limit this as much as possible. Once I'm done pouring the plaster, I then vibrate the table, causing any of the trapped air bubbles to release and rise to the surface. With my finger, I am just double checking to make sure that my plaster is indeed at least one inch above my hummingbird. Once you've combined your plaster with water, there is no turning back.
the plaster will begin to set up on its own without you even doing anything. This is because once the water is combined with the plaster, the plaster actually resets itself as a gypsum crystal lattice, and it goes through an exothermic reaction causing the plaster to heat up and to harden. So you need to let your plaster molds go through this conversion process before you begin to open it. It is safe to open your mold after it has reached its maximum temperature and begins to cool down. It doesn't have to be cool to open it, it just has to start to cool down before you open it. And it has to have reached its maximum temperature before you can open it. Once your mold has heated and hardened, it's time to remove the cottle boards, flip it over, remove the clay bed, and build the sprues on this side of the mold. As I'm preparing my plaster bed to cast the second side, I want to take a little bit more time to explain some important properties of plaster. Plaster has a coefficient of expansion of 1%, meaning your plaster mold will expand by 1%. As it starts to cool, it starts to expand. And so if you are working with something delicate, and if you think it's going to be difficult to pull the original piece out of the mold, then you'd want to really be on top of it and be very quick. So you would want to open the mold. Once it just starts to cool down, you would cast your other side and wait for that other side to just start to cool down and then open it so that you can remove the object before it fully expands and really grabs a hold of that object inside the mold. And so it will make it a lot easier to take it out. Again, your plaster mold doesn't have to be all the way cool to open it. It can still be rather hot when you open it. You just want to make sure that it has reached its maximum temperature before you open it. Since my object inside the mold is made out of clay, this is not crucial. I do not have to go through this process quickly. I can take my time in regard to opening the mold. Generally speaking, I like to make my mold all in one day. This is not always necessary, but since my object inside the mold is clay, if I take longer than one day, I run the risk of the object inside the mold shrinking before I cast the other side. So start to finish, I like to make a mold all in one day. So the next question is, how long does this process take? So that all depends on the temperature of the water you use, the temperature of your studio, as well as the humidity level. Uh, on hot days, it sets up more quickly. On cold days, it sets up more slowly. So you might find that it takes anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes for your mold to set up. I always find that the second half of the mold sets up more quickly because it's reacting to the first half of the mold you've created. For the second half, I mix the water and plaster the exact same way as I did the first half of the mold. It is important that I use the exact same amount of plaster and water on this side of the mold to ensure that both sides of the mold are equal. While the plaster is slaking, I will finish preparing the second half of the mold. Next, I then apply one coat of Murphy oil soap onto the plaster bed. So it's very important to get a nice generous coat of Murphy oil soap on your plaster. I've been told to apply three coats, but really you only need to apply one. I think mostly people tell you to apply three coats just to make sure that you haven't missed a spot and you have really good coverage. You wanna make sure that you're doing a good job applying your Murphy oil soap to the plaster bed. You want good even coverage and you also don't want your Murphy oil soap to pool. If you create pools, just get rid of them. The reason you don't want to have pools of Murphy oil soap on your plaster bed is because the new plaster that you pour on top of that will try to combine with the oil soap, creating weak points. In addition, if your pools of Murphy oil soap are large enough, it will repel the plaster and then you will have pockets of air where the mold does not fit snugly together. I also am being careful not to apply Murphy oil soap onto the hummingbird. It's not necessary to have Murphy oil soap on the hummingbird because the hummingbird is clay, it will release easily from the plaster mold. I could apply Murphy oil soap to the hummingbird, but it is not necessary. And 
I do not want to create brush strokes with the Murphy oil soap on the hummingbird because all of those brush strokes will slip cast. They will read in the mold. They will be present in the mold. And then when I slip cast the hummingbird, I will consistently have to sponge off the brush strokes. You never want to forget to add the Murphy oil soap onto this half of the plaster mold. If you do forget to add your Murphy oil soap, it may be very difficult or even impossible to separate the two halves. So I always use Murphy oil soap as a mold release agent. In a pinch, you can use dish soap, but it bubbles and suds up. For sure, you never want to use Vaseline as a mold release agent. The problem with Vaseline is that it permeates the mold. The Vaseline creates a barrier and it repels water. It works very similar to Scotchgard. Therefore, if you try to slip cast with a mold where Vaseline has been used, it basically waterproofs the mold and prevents the absorption of water from the slip. So remember, your plaster mold should be like a gigantic sponge and it should be able to take the water out of the slip and turn it into clay. If there's Vaseline on there, it's preventing it from doing its job and it's not going to be able to remove the water from the slip. Once I have added the sprues and I've cleaned them up nicely, it's time to repeat the process by adding cottle boards and sealing up all the edges of the boards with some clay coils so that it doesn't leak when I pour in the plaster. I'd like to talk more about the volume method. The reason I prefer the volume method is because it is very fast and efficient. There are other methods out there of creating plaster, um, for example, the island method, which is not very efficient. The way the island method works is you start with your water as usual, and then you sift in your plaster until you have what looks like an island. And so this seems like a really fast and easy, straightforward process. But in reality, it's not as simple as you would think. When I do the island method, I sift in my plaster as usual to create my island. And as I'm creating my island, I'm constantly thinking, is this a big enough island? Hmm, I don't really know. So I spent a lot of time thinking through the process on whether or not I have a big enough island. This becomes a problem when you're slip casting. For example, if your mold is more densely packed with plaster on one side than it is on the other side, then the plaster mold will draw the water out of the slip unevenly, meaning your slip cast wall will be uneven. It will be thick on one side where the plaster is pulling out more water, and it will be thinner on the other side where the plaster is less dense and pulling out less water. Right now, I'm touching it up a little bit with some more Murphy oil soap because in the process of adding those clay coils, I may have removed some of that Murphy oil soap and so I want to make sure that it has good coverage. In addition to the island method, there is the weighing method of mixing plaster. As usual, you need to decide how much water you're going to use. Then you check the chart to see how much plaster is required. The problem with this is that the ratio is always written down in grams of plaster. Therefore, you have to weigh out your plaster on a scale, which takes a lot of time. So you can see why the volume method is so fast and easy. There are ways you can speed up your plaster set time. Mixing up your plaster with warm water rather than cold water will speed up the process, meaning your plaster will set up more quickly. If you want to speed up your process, you certainly can use the warm water. I have in the past used warm water and it seems to speed up my process too quickly and I end up creating a sloppy mold. So I personally prefer to use cold water. Another way to speed up the process of your plaster set time is to mix your plaster quickly. Some people use a drill or a handheld blending device to speed up their blending process, which additionally speeds up the set time of the plaster. I personally don't do this method because I'm not interested in speeding up my process. One thing I didn't address earlier is how to decide how much water you will need to begin the plaster mixing process. I personally just eyeball it. 
you can do the method where you figure out your volume, which is length times width times height. And then you check the plaster chart to see how much plaster you need to weigh out and then how much water you need to measure out. But I don't ever bother with this. Um, this is why I like the volume method because it is so fast and easy. So the next question is, well, what happens if I miscalculated and I didn't create enough plaster? Well, that's not that big of a deal. Plaster loves itself. And so you can just mix up more plaster and pour it right on the top. So you can do that while the plaster is still wet. If you want, you can even wait until the plaster sets up and dries. If I wait till the plaster sets up and dries before I add another layer, then I just make sure to score that dried plaster, um, create some sort of texture on there, some sort of undercuts, so that when I pour on the fresh plaster on top of it, it will really stick to it and it won't want to come apart. But again, plaster loves itself. And if you don't use a mold release agent, it will stick to itself and you will have a very difficult time pulling it off of itself. Okay, once you've poured your plaster and you've finished vibrating the air bubbles out, you just have to wait for it to set up. It might take maybe 20 minutes, it just depends. And so once it's heated up and it's starting to cool down, you can go ahead and pop it open. In the meantime, I like to clean it up while it's still somewhat soft and moist. I shave down the edges all around, all sides of the edges with a sure form. Uh, you never want to shave any off the inside of the mold because then you've just messed it up and distorted what you've created. The reason you want to clean off all of your edges is because right now they're really sharp. And because they're sharp, they can easily chip off and land into your slip casting material. And if that gets into your clay, then you're causing problems with your clay because it will crack because of the plaster embedded in it. Now it's time to open your mold. Sometimes it pops open really easily. Sometimes I have to use a putty knife and a hammer to kind of pry them open. If I have to pry them open, I always pry it open from the top because you run the risk of putting a hole in your mold if you're prying them open and you don't want a hole in the side of your mold or in the bottom of the mold. So if you have to pry it open with a uh, putty knife, pry it open from the top. There are other important things to know as you're cleaning up your plaster mold. So it's very important to shave down the outside perimeter of your mold so that you don't have any sharp edges that will chip and get into your slip cast clay. Once you've cleaned off your edges with the sure form, it's time to clean up the mold. And so I run it under water and I wash all of those plaster bits off of my mold. So you also will want to wash off any of the clay residue that's left behind, as well as the Murphy oil soap. So that Murphy oil soap you painted on to the one side of the mold, that needs to come off. So you're going to want to wash that off with vinegar. Vinegar cuts the soap uh, really nicely and cleans it off really easily. So I simply just squeeze out my sponge, you know, make it as dry as I can. And then I, you know, pour some vinegar on my sponge and then I just rub it off. And so once that's all rubbed off, I wash that side under the sink as well. And now you've got a nice working mold. Once you get it all cleaned up, it's still not yet ready to cast. It needs to dry before you can slip cast with it. Because what you have now is a fully saturated sponge, essentially. The plaster is a fully saturated sponge. And in order for the plaster to do its job, it needs to be dry. So that when you pour the liquid slip inside your mold, uh, the plaster is dry and it soaks out the water out of the slip and turns it into a nice even clay wall. So if your mold is really wet, if it's saturated with water, it's not going to be able to draw any more water out of the slip, and so it's not going to work. So it depends on how big your mold is and how dry your climate is. You can let it air dry, and maybe it'll take about a week. I often put them in front of a fan, and it takes a couple of days. 